Good evening to everyone. All good things come to an end, and tonight we are having the closing session of our lecture series on ecology and the metamorphosis of modern society. The sixth evening is not only particular because it is the last. It is also particular in terms of its objective and form. Our lecture series started last November with an introductory lecture in which my colleague Kat Lux and I presented the hypothesis of socio-ecological metamorphosis and situated metamorphosis in a broader historical context. One of the points we made, which will be directly relevant to tonight's discussion, is a distinction between transformation and metamorphosis. Transformation has become quite a buzzword in environmental discourse, even in core institutions of global environmental governance, such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Discourse on transformation is often normative and prescriptive. It is about defining pathways towards sustainable development, about problem solving and what is flagged as transformative usually remains within the established frameworks of our modern social order. Metamorphosis, as we understand it, building partly on the work of the German sociologist Ulrich Beck, is quite different. Metamorphosis describes a transitory and intensive period of transmutation, the decay and dysfunction of a prevailing social order and the emergence of something radically new. Not new in the sense that everything would be invented from scratch, but new in the sense of new ordering principles, new ways of seeing the world, of being in the world and of addressing the predicaments of our individual and collective existence. Are we currently entering a phase of metamorphosis? As climate change and the massive loss of biodiversity are recognized as existential threats, can we identify a cultural and institutional destabilization or even decay of the modern order and the emergence of new worldviews, institutional arrangements and practices beyond the modern paradigm? Over the course of this lecture series, we had the pleasure to explore this question by learning from and exchanging with five distinguished scholars from the Netherlands, France, Belgium and the UK. In December, Jens Lachmund from Maastricht University combined history and science studies to decipher the bottom-up emergence and subsequent political organization of urban agriculture in London. In January, Christophe Bonneuil from the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris questioned the idea of an ongoing metamorphosis by outlining what he called historical regimes of planetarity and by showing empirically that many features of contemporary radical ecological critique of modernity are not as new as it is often claimed. In her lecture on narratives of climate change in contemporary spirituality, Susanna Crockford from Ghent University focused on New Age groups in southern Arizona. She showed how some of their views on climate change question foundational values, truths and institutions of the prevailing order, with quite disturbing consequences. Finally, last week, David Chandler and Jonathan Pugh presented their fascinating work on Anthropocene Islands, a work that resolutely leaves modern ways of thinking behind and seeks to identify new ways of thinking, of being and of doing politics in the entangled realities of a destabilized Anthropocene. One of the many things I learned from these lectures is that metamorphosis is both a productive hypothesis and a challenging one. The first challenge is empirical. What is often described as new ways of relating to the planet based on increasing environmental awareness of the existential dangers or challenges of the Anthropocene is not necessarily new. And yet, there seems to be a shift. The modernist project of controlling and exploiting the world in the name of a linear human progress, which became hegemonic towards the late 19th century, appears increasingly dysfunctional, while alternative worldviews and practices that were considered backward or irrational seem to gain relevance and prominence. In other words, as in any phase of transition, it is difficult to empirically distinguish the old from the new, as both get mixed up in intricate ways. Another challenge is epistemological. 
most of us have been socialized in a modern context. The modern premises on what constitutes reality, such as on the separation between humans and nature, or on the progressive character of modern institutions such as capitalism, national states or techno-scientific rationality, are deeply entrenched. As the classical book of Berger and Luckmann on the social construction of reality shows, questioning this established representation of reality is one of the most difficult things to do, both personally and because the dominant social order fights back. And yet, how can we capture something like metamorphosis without freeing oneself from the core assumptions underpinning the modern framework? In the previous lectures, we addressed such questions from a sociological, a historical or an ethnographic point of view. Tonight, we will discuss what metamorphosis can mean for people who engage very concretely in addressing the ecological crisis in their daily work by venturing outside established practices and frames of reference. We are extremely pleased and honored to have three such engaged changemakers with us tonight for this discussion on socio-ecological metamorphosis in practice. Owolabi Aboyade, Javi Agaval and Jihan Geron. Welcome to the three of you and thank you for accepting our invitation. At this point, Lowelin and I would like to introduce you briefly to our audience. Actually, it is more something like trying to introduce you briefly, as your respective trajectories and fields of practice cannot easily be put into boxes. Jihan Guerin, so in your own words, you're an indigenous feminist, painter, writer, organizer and facilitator, and a leader in indigenous environmental justice. You are Diné and Black and come originally from Old Sawmill, Arizona, which is on the Navajo Nation graduated in Earth Sciences at Stanford University. You serve on various foundations boards and you work over the past 15 years, particularly with the Black Mesa Water Coalition, Indigenous Environmental Network, Climate Justice Alliance and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. This work has made you a nationally recognized and awarded movement leader in environmental and climate justice, just transition Indigenous people's rights and indigenous feminism. At the age of 35, you were diagnosed with endometrial cancer and as part of your journey of healing, you turned to painting, created, creating bold works that featured the animals, people and other beings that protected, motivated and transformed you during your recovery. Owolabi Aboyade. So in your own words also, you're a divorced father and cultural worker from Detroit in the USA. You have studied biology and philosophy at Stanford and Michigan universities, as well as poetics. You served as the executive director of the East Michigan Environmental Action Council, as a local co-coordinator for the 2010 US Social Forum, and as a lead organizer for the 2011 Detroit to Dakar delegation to the World Social Forum. You have been negotiating kidney failure since 1990 and have survived lymphoma, heart failure, and other physical ailments. You are the coordinator of Community Care Circle Program for Detroit Disability Power and a founding member of Relentless Bodies, a disability justice-based creative collective from Detroit. You're also a hip-hop artist, known as Will C, and writes awarded science fiction poetry. Thank you, Laurelyn. Ravi, I first met you as founding director of Toxics Link in 2007 in Delhi, when I was starting field research for my dissertation. And it is always a great pleasure to see you again. You have been involved in countless environmental campaigns, some of which proved quite influential on India's environmental policies. You are also an artist, a photographer, a curator and a writer, and to transact boundaries between these various fields. I think, for instance, of your testimony in a judicial court in India on the relevance of art as evidence in environmental impact assessments on controversial large infrastructure projects. Well, thanks a lot, Damien, and happy to make the transition between the scientific reflections you have shared and the artists who are on our panel today. In the name of One Radiant Earth, we're also very grateful you accepted our invitation to discuss the limitless topic of metamorphosis with other artists, activists, and post-activists 
navigating different geographical, socio-economic, racial and gendered realities. We're very curious to hear about your respective experience, artistic practice and visions of today and tomorrow to help us grasp the cultural and social phenomenon of metamorphosis that may or may not be unfolding around us, but that at some level we're already contributing to through this panel and lecture series. The voices of artists are also essential for this closing session as their presence sheds the light on the dialogue we have opened in between arts and science through this lecture series and ha that has remained somewhat incomplete and perhaps one-sided. In short, there could be many more mutual exchanges between arts and science, meaning also collaboration between artists and scientists on an equal footing. And we do believe at One Resident Earth that this could lead to both more creative and more grounded art and science. But let's reflect on a few takeaways from the lecture. So we chose to show artworks, not as illustrations, but as perspectives of their own on each topic that were discussed during the lecture series. We did not want to utilize art to beautify, to beautify PowerPoint presentations and to lose the meaning of each artwork in the process. By keeping each piece standalone, we added a number of critical or alternative voices to each lecture, which would resonate differently with each member of the audience. As part of a team who has seen each video a number of times, it was also fascinating to see the different layers of understanding in the presentation that the artworks helped us unpack. Yet, for some, the artworks may have felt either like exciting bonuses or slightly out of place for a lecture series. What was to be done was this load of additional artistic information, sometimes moving chords deep inside or sending one stream of thought in a very different direction than the one that would have been taken with the lecture alone. Is it not disorienting? Does it really help <clears throat> scientific research? In the end, do we really want to or need to break out of the modernist framework in which we're operating to do scientific work? Through this lecture series experience, what I found stimulating was a form of tension even today to the introduction of artworks to spur critical thinking and creativity in this academic context and how it differs from several other experiences I've had. Um, for instance, while I was working with the UN, with thinkers and futures literacy designers working on transformative change or on the ground, such as with a local community in Atlantic Canada aspiring to build their long-term resilience. So it made me wonder whether those past projects or conceptual discussions on the synergies between the arts and science that One Resident Earth is involved in are either missing from the radar of academia or related to a kind of bubble we are evolving in. And if it is a bubble, are there other such bubbles? Is it a trend? Is the blurring of boundaries between arts, science and policy making spreading in different contexts? What does it hold for us? Is it a way forward or an escape? What would it mean in terms of being, working, doing politics at a larger scale? This is the thinking that informed the co-design of this panel discussion on the side of One Resident Earth and which led to the formulation of three questions for the panelists. So let's start with the first question right away. So in your work and with the communities you are involved in, do you see the current ecological crisis as inducing a metamorphosis? In other words, do you see something radically new emerging out of the dissolution of the existing order? Or do you witness more continuities, which would lead to either incremental changes or transformations, but within the existing order? I'm a writer, so I, uh, I wrote out a few things. Um, first, I invite everyone here to notice your body. I invite you to notice how you're sitting, whatever those points of contact are with your seat or with the ground. I can feel my heart beating a little faster. <laughs> Observe your breath. Observe it gently and playfully, let it be what it is. I invite you to deepen that breath. 
and connect with your body again. I invite you to observe your body. Is there any place that's particularly calling your attention right now? Whether that's a pain, whether that's a pleasure, whether that's a tingling, a rumbling, whatever it may be, you know, not me. I invite you to notice that. I invite you to call your breath into that place as you continue your deep breaths. But send the breath to that particular place. But playfully, playfully. Flow with it. Breathe with it. Breathe into it. And lastly, even though we're in different places, I invite you to breathe, coming back to the room, the virtual room, the virtual screen that we were breathing together, that we are breathing wherever we are together in this exchange. I begin with this bodily activity because I realized, even in the few minutes of being here, that the modern body cannot hear, much less feel everything that I am bringing to this presentation. And so part of this initial presentation is an invitation to a bodily metamorphosis in order that we can participate in this societal metamorphosis that people seem to be looking for. When I was in graduate school, my mentor, Dr. Bunyan Bryant, hosted a conference on environment and epistemological crisis. Dr. Bunyan Bryant is emeritus professor at University of Michigan and was a groundbreaking scholar activist who was part of the initial formulation of environmental justice. And I wouldn't be where I am today without him. And what I took away from his conference, this conference is, it's not the high school dropouts or those who couldn't cut it in this current educational system that are creating climate catastrophes. It is the society's master implementers of business, technology, military, or law. And they've been churned out repeatedly for a few centuries now. A dear collaborator, Bridget Q from the Awe Society, recently sent me a message saying that there are two important fronts of battle we are facing now, the fight for our attention and the fight for water. The fight for our attention and the fight for water. This is a fight to commodify every essential aspect of life so that it is normal to watch people die if they don't have the money to procure their essentials. This is a fight to control these essentials, these living forces of our planet to make sure they're controlled by economic agents. And this is a fight to monetize your time so that you are always connected to something that is part of the monetary exchange in your waking life. Even in your sleeping life, do they even have sleep apps now? Waking or sleeping life, I guess so. An ad, an app, a platform, you know, you're always part of this monetary exchange. I mentioned these fights in the context of metamorphosis because there are forces, institutions, and individuals that either want to shape the change, resist the change, guide the direction, plug you in, have you thinking that you're changing when you're, uh, when you're still plugged in, you know, still plugged in, you know. And so I send greetings from Detroit, um, which has one of the largest concentrations of Africans in the Western Hemisphere. I send greetings in a city where hundreds of thousands have had their water shut off in their home for failure to pay. The United Nations even sent a special rapporteur to come to Detroit and investigate and condemn these practices. I send for you from Detroit greetings, an important center of cultural African culture that is self-determined and lives our culture to reclaim our attention from the United States, which has always monetized us and always has monetized our sufferings. 
I send greetings from this time of virus, which is touching bodies all over the world and shifting our relationship to our bodies. I invited you in the beginning to connect with the wisdom of your body, which comes from the earth. And to lastly, just say that this metamorphosis is a ritual. It is not a spectator sport. It is not to merely be observed and discussed. Um, today, it is my hope that we will not just talk about metamorphosis, but that we will be the metamorphosis and that this session today will help us to exist and to more fully exist. And when we collectively listen to our bodies, we will have new eyes to see new possibilities and our bodies will do different things than we did the day before. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great start. Um, connecting with the present moment, with our bodies, our materiality, and uh, yeah, giving so many, so many inputs and, and ideas. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll just pass the floor to to another of our uh, panel members uh, who would like maybe to react and to uh, also share her or his. Uh, views on the question so that slowly we will um, build up bring bring together and build up uh, your, your ways of relating to the questions that we put in the room um <clears throat> let's see uh, i was just trying to eat some food really quick before i so now i feel better that was what my body needed <laughs> but one of the things my body needed was like let me go ahead and just eat this food before i jump on <laughs> so thank you for that permission um, yeah, I think this is a very interesting um, topic, and I think it's totally right on for what I'm experiencing and where I'm at. I think, like, society in general, you know, like our global society, you know, this hypothesis is probably true that we're going through, you know, a big change to what we've considered to be, like, normal values, you know, and the values that most of us grew up with. But I think that there's um, the first thoughts that came to my mind is there's a lot of difference between different communities you know, about um, how much modernity we've accepted or been a part of um, or is ingrained in us. And I think that especially for indigenous peoples, like to answer the question di directly um, and, and also to explain, <clears throat> again, I'm half Navajo and I'm half black. My dad's family, who's my black side of my family, is from Chicago. My mom's from the Navajo Nation. Uh, in Northern Arizona. So that's where I, I grew up in Northern Arizona. Um, I live here now um, at the base of our Western Sacred Mountain as Navajo people. And that's where a lot of my work has been. And my work, the organizing work has been around environmental justice. So it's particularly with impacts to water on the Navajo Nation and impacts um, just to the land and people's health on the Navajo Nation. Navajo Nation is a battery for the Southwest. That's how we've always described it. So coal mining, uranium mining, oil and gas mining, fracking, water mining. Um, these are all things that happen to the Navajo Nation so that cities like Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Phoenix um, could be built. You know, without the Navajo Nation, none of these communities would be built because they have no water, no, no electricity. Um, and at the same time, the Navajo people have received don't have electricity <laughs> and don't have running water. So it's like 75% of all unelectrified homes in the United States are on my reservation. I grew up without running water, you know, um, without plumbing and things like that. It's normal. So just to show that huge injustice, right, that has existed um, uh, around coal mining and particularly since the 1970s, um, but, you know, going back 500 years to when colonization started in the Americas, you know, <clears throat> um, and our land became resources in that, and those resources were taken through mass extermination of our people, um, and termination of our people, you know, Holocaust of Native Americans and indigenous people throughout the Americas. Um, so, but that was forced on us within 500 years, and I think we're at a totally different place then we're, I would say like in the metamorphosis days, we're in that like pupa stage where like the Navajo nation is like being broken down into its bits. And I don't know what's gonna emerge, you know, um, coming up next because on the one hand, 
um, we ha we are economic. We've been made to be economically dependent on extraction of our resources. You know, on the other hand, yes, our culture and our language and our ways of life and connection of land still exist, and they exist at the same time. So, um, things like patriarchy, you know, <laughs> capitalism, individualism, um, the idea that we need to work in order to get money, and that's how we live, or um, those are all really new to us, you know, they are new to our people. And I just, I, I want to say that truly, you know, because a lot of people, you know, there, a lot of what indigenous people's face, especially in America and the U S is invisibilization. So the idea that like, Oh man, you guys don't exist anymore. Or, you know, you're just in museums, you know, like that's what most people in America <laughs> think, you know? Um, so we fight against that a lot. Um, but the policies that have been put on indigenous peoples is assimilation. So I like to like my grandfather, for example, was a medicine man and he was put in jail for doing ceremonies as part of the policies of the U.S. government. Um, my mother, you know, she grew up. I love to tell a story. My mother grew up not really knowing what time or clock was. Right? <laughs> she said the first time she really even knew what a clock was or kind of conceptually was because where I'm from again is called old sawmill because those are one of the resources that was first taken was timber um, and my grandpa worked there too so <clears throat> there would be a whistle at 8 a.m and a whistle at 5 p.m and to her that was just like oh that's when my dad goes to work and when he comes back but like before that she didn't really think about time <laughs> and at the same so that's what I mean by it. it's very recent you know what I mean and at the same time, my mom was part of the assimilation policies, you know, so she was intentionally targeted and moved into cities so that she would forget her indigenous way of life. That's after being forced into boarding schools in which they use extreme violence to beat out indigeneity from our people, from my mother. You know what I'm saying? So the metamorphosis, I, I feel like we're still in the last metamorphosis. You know what I mean? <laughs> still. Um, and, but I also, so it, it's curious it it's to me it's still a big question mark what's going to come out because half of us are still in our or not half of us half of ourselves you know as navajo people are still in our own ways and half of ourselves are in this modern life that we've been forced to it's funny because i feel like all the indigenous um ways of life are coming back now and that's what people are are saying are the new things or things that people are relearning that's just stuff that was beaten out of us a generation ago, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's really frustrating to like, uh, all the policies that were put on us, for example, like how we managed our land. It's a huge way of, you know, how our world changes, like how the gover federal government enforced us to manage our land. So now our land is really suffering from desertification, from erosion, because, you know, they came and forced us to like stop moving around and stop living in clans, but you guys all can live in these like individual units and that degradate that has degraded our landscape. Now the federal government is coming back and saying like, oh my gosh, this is so unsustainable. We're going to teach you about sustainability, but that's what we did in the first place. You know what I mean? So we're in this kind of weird loop where I feel like a lot of native communities are like 1950s America. You know, we're just learning about patriarchy and it's just being a layered on top of our cultural practices and ceremonies and things like that. So we're in a unique place. Um, but also, um, I think that that unique place puts us in a unique position to guide a lot of these discussions as indigenous people um, to share what we know, which then requires that we also have those discussions within ourselves of like, what do we share? And how do we share it? Because in instances where we have shared it, right? That's why now there's a lot of non-Indigenous people running quote unquote ceremonies and doing things like this. Like, like Will said, like the, the pre this is not just you do step A, step B, step three. It's about engaging, you know, more than the reality that we see, you know? And with that missing, our world can't change that much. You know? <laughs> so it's the question of how is that taught anyway? That's a beginning space. Oh, and I wanted to say one more concrete thing about how is the ecological crisis impacting our people? Well, what we fought against uh, as part of our organ my organization, Black Mesa Water Coalition, 
um, was to shut down two coal mine, mine, coal mines on Black Mesa, which is you know um, a region where those coal mines and so both of those coal fire plants are are um, shut down now. The second one was shut down last year because of you know all the reasons we've been saying like impacts to environment and that coal is on its way out. So now that's push, putting us in a in a in a, a bit of a crisis. So. Um, what we're going to do next. So we have a lot of opportunity to change as Navajo people in that respect. Sorry, I don't think that was very short, but <laughs> I got excited talking That's about good. it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. For, it was very rich uh, in, in the many things you conveyed uh, in this first answer. So thank you very much, uh, Jihan. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ravi, uh, would you like to to share your views on, on the question uh, we asked. Um, yeah, uh, so I will refrain from reacting or commenting and just pass, okay. pass the word over to you. Thank you. Firstly, thank you. Uh, nice to see you again, Damien. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, nice to meet you, Lorraine, and uh, two wonderful presentations before me. Uh, I'd, uh, I've been struggling with this word metamorphosis because it is not an easy word to cope with. Uh, because it, uh, to me, to my mind, also implies a change of trajectory, a new new set of conditions, a new uh, 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 something which is something which is freshly created, uh, with almost no no connection to the past. Something which shifts the structures through which we are constantly operating to new structures. And uh, when I think of uh, ecology and ecosystems, then. Yeah, I, I do think of their embedment in political, economic, and social structures because I think in the Anthropocene we know that the ecosystem issues are, uh, are not separate from all the societal, social, and from the social contract. And this nature being out of the social contract is uh, is causing some of these problems in a sense that when you try and read nature back as it already exists, but we don't sort of account for it. So. Uh, is the whole system undergoing a radical change? You know, is that uh, because metamorphosis morphosis is an is an is an effect which emerges from everything else changing around? It's not, as you said, transformative. It's not a program. It's something which appears in a sense. So I wanted to give some an example of uh, I worked with a, a traditional fishing community as an artist and environmentalist for several years. Uh, Recently, you know, uh, I still have connections with them, but as 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 a as a body of work, I worked with them till 2016, and I the kind of changes I saw in what was a 2,000 year old community, which using traditional boats and traditional fishing on on the ocean on on the uh, on the Bay of Bengal, which is the southern uh, coast of the Indian Indian uh, coastline. Uh, you, you see that the, the community is in breaking up within a matter of a short, even as I observed, within a matter of a few years. Uh, I saw the community being broken up, being isolated politically and economically. Uh, within the communities, uh, I saw that fishing had become a business uh, from being a livelihood. And uh, those who could not participate in the business propositions of, the, of, of fishing were either left out or discarded or completely marginalized. So within the community itself, there were new uh, heterogeneities, new fractures, which did not exist before because all of them were traditional fishermen. Now the some have become businessmen, have bought boats with engines on them, have partnered with, with, uh, with other businessmen. So there's a fracture of the community itself in a sense. And uh, the, they are also facing new kinds of competition from a new large scale capitalist in capitalistic and market based fishing like trawlers. Uh, and uh, uh, again, those who have engine boats are, have find it easier to, to, uh, to, to still get a catch, but those who are traditionally paddle boats, uh, you know, uh, which were wooden boats and have become now fiberglass boats, they are not able to, uh, uh, to survive. What has happened because of that, that they don't want the children, the next generation to be fisher people, fisher folk, to be fishers anymore. And the next generation are going to school uh, and to university to become engineers or bankers or accountants. So it's almost like the end of the traditional fishing line uh, uh, for them. And 
So it, within the landscape as well, you know, for example, one of the critical things for critical landscapes for any traditional fishing community is beaching the boat. That the boat has to come to a beach, which is a gradual transition from the ocean to pulled up on the beach. And if the beach starts disappearing, they cannot fish anymore because they cannot they cannot park their boats. They cannot pull their boats in. And uh, and because of new ports being coming coming up uh, further up uh, upstream from the coastline, uh, from how the currents flow, you see the sand which is flowing down, uh, commercial ports coming up, the sand which is flowing down to these beaches reducing. Uh, and uh, it's circulating differently, so the beaches are eroding. And you can see to, to stop the beaches being eroding, they put this uh, stone groins up. And those groins become both, uh, you know, harbors of uh, fresh garbage, but also uh, where they have downstream impacts. So where the groins, on the next beach, the groins deteriorate the currency, the currents deteriorate, deteriorate the sand even more. So while a far part of the beach is maintained, uh, fish are fishing, the other part on the other side of the groin, downstream of the groin, uh, almost completely disappears. So uh, it's, it becomes like a protected space, but you see new things like microplastics on the beach. We measured microplastics uh, uh, being washed ashore and they obviously go into uh, marine animals as well. And uh, the whole beach from a fishing beach where the fishermen used to, uh, fishers used to sleep at night is becoming a tourist beach because it's the only uh, few beaches left. So everybody's there's new, new, new water sport. There are, they're selling their homes to get no new capital to become better fishers and the, where they're selling the home to hotels and to tourism people and the tourism people have new, uh, you know, um, uh, basically very uh, sort of uh, uh, destructive kind of tourism, which brings all the worst part of tourism into so resorts of coming up, the cars and motorcycles where there was no cars or motorcycles uh, have come up and the sea is slowly coming in more and more. And this is very, I, I, even I perceive that every year the tide comes in a little closer to, the, to where, the, where the huts are. And I've experienced stronger storms and tidal waves uh, over time. So uh, there, is, uh, there is this kind of uh, loss of agency because normally politically how an agency, suppose you know something happens to, the, to, to some member of the community they would go to the local politician or they protest or something like that. If somebody changes the, uh, the, how the fishing market operates, they will protest. Here, they don't know what to do because the, the wave of change is so broad that they, they, they have no particular agency what to do. How do they, how, they don't know where the change is coming from. It's just all around them, like a tsunami of, of change. So I think there's a loss, what one calls agency in a, in a political system. Uh, seems to have diffused in, and become very uh, sort of, you don't know where where it is. And the individual agency also doesn't have a specific uh, way to deal with it. So traditional, uh, you know, uh, democratic ways of resistance, what are you resisting? What will you resist? Uh, and uh, it's, uh, community has slowly breaking up culturally, spiritually, uh, from uh, a cohesive cultural and spiritual community to one of gainer, gain, gainers and, and losers. And uh, there's also, so it leads to something much deeper happening, which is not well understood. And even if you look at it from one particular disciplinary lens, it's very hard to figure out, you know. Uh, so there is a case for looking at it uh, from traditional trans multidisciplinary lenses or interdisciplinary lenses. It's very hard to make out what's happening. And so the on the ground conditions is like a, a slippery slope of change. But I think what really concerns me is the, is the time frame in which this change is happening. So, you know, uh, like, like Kafka's uh, buck forming <laughs> overnight, this overnight is, or if you take a 2000 year old traditional uh, community fishing community, then I think a couple of decades is almost overnight. Well, thank you, Ravi. So many, so many different um, aspects, dimensions uh, that flew in already uh, in those three uh, 
answer the reactions that we that we received from you. So uh, to the three of you, thank you very much. Um, I already have tons of questions, remarks, etc., uh, flowing to my mind, but I will um, keep quiet for the moment and uh, give the word to Laureline if you want to moderate the Q and A, uh, opening the, the floor to to the public. Um, and maybe moderating the, the exchanges. Uh, and there's, uh, as always in, in Zoom, depending on the version of the program, there's, there's a small blue hand or the small hand you can use to, if you would like to to, uh, to share a comment or uh, formulate a question. Um, if you do not find the blue hand, uh, you can also just activate your microphone uh, and, um, and uh, use a proper opportunity to, to speak and uh, Intervene. So, um, yeah, thank you, Ravi, Jehan, and uh, Uwalabi, and uh, now Laureline, I, I give you the floor. Yeah, so Damon has just said if you can either like click on the virtual hand or just switch your camera on and raise your hand so we, I think we can all see one another on one screen. So, if there are any questions, um, please do come forward. Colonialism has often led to cultural cringe. That is, indigenous peoples have often internalized the idea that Western culture is superior to their own. Cultural cringe and the mimicry of Western culture have generally served elites, often with high costs for the broader population. How might we avoid the traps of cultural cringe and mimicry of the West? Hmm. Well, I think... I think unlearning is more important than learning. And I think like all people should, should think about that. You know what I mean? Like, um, rather than this, this trajectory of like, oh, we're just always going forward. I think when you do that, you leave things behind, you know, um, which not, which I also don't think like, oh, if we just all go quote unquote, go back, you know, then everything's going to be solved. I also don't really agree with that like very simple statement, you know? Um, but I do think that um, because like indigenous cultures, I think have so much to teach indig like everybody about the values and kind of like base practices of these cultures. Because I mean, think about this, that like less, less than 5% of the world's population is indigenous, but we manage or have like a say over 25% of the world's land and we're responsible for 80% of the world's biodiversity. Like how, you know, what? because our cultures and I, I don't, maybe I won't get into that, but it's like, because our cultures are place based. You can't be, you know what I'm saying? You can't be indigenous, yeah. not on your land. I mean, you can, right. But our cultures are about the place. So like where I live, like I live, I said, by the base of, one of our mountains to Navajo people. It's like our Western boundary and one of our sacred mountains. So I also know that this place is where certain um, deities in my culture live. I know that that place is where the first woman received like her first, the first blessing way ceremony was performed. So I can drive around my homelands and point to places and things that are quote unquote myth, but to me, they're not. Do you know what I mean? So I say, yeah, very high context, as you even higher than what would people say high context these days with culture. But yeah. uh, like our medicines, you know, our ceremonies are about these pl these lands, these deities, these plants, you know, these waters. So I, I mean, I'm from the high desert. So what I do is not going to be the same as the indigenous peoples where O lives, you know, in the Great Lakes where they have forests and trees. Like I'm from the desert. You know what I mean? So it can't be translated that way. And that's kind of the point, right? Is that these cultures are developed through long, long, long-term interaction with the land, trial and error and learning by doing. So that's where their value lies. But I think that there's also, um, this is what I'm interested in, <laughs> you know, in my work moving forward is like, so what are the things, the values that are common among these indigenous ways of life um, not getting down into details. Like, I'm not going to go and say, everybody, all humans need to do blessing way ceremonies now. No. You know what I mean? But I will say, all humans need to find ways to heal their spiritual selves. You know what I mean? Like, 
So, I mean, I feel like that's what we need, like, or is definitely what I'm interested in focusing on and figuring out is those kind of like, because I think, you know, there is a human, you know, human understanding beyond tribes, beyond locales, right? Human basis of how we should be living on the land that we, we probably all inherently know. And so then how do we access those things? And a big part of it is unlearning how we think, like even kind of reading the description of this of like, the, there's a difference between uh, metamorphosis and transformation. I'm trying to teach myself to stop defining and categorizing things, period. I need to unlearn that because that makes me think a certain way. It makes me think things are separate and hierarchical, and that's not true. My language, my Navajo language, and most indig indigenous languages are about the relationships between things. So it's not a table. It's like the thing that you use to do this. Do you know what I mean? Or it's not a yes. dog. It's like the animal that does this for our people or did this for our people. You know what I mean? So like those very basic unlearnings, I think we need to figure out ways to, to do as individuals, but also like organizations and larger groups collectively. I just wanted to piggyback on Jihan's point um, with my perspective as an African and this word cultural cringe is very interesting or this drive towards assimilation. And I think what both of the other uh, presenters talked about is that this thing of assimilation, there's so much violence and force in it, whether that's physical violence, economic violence, mental violence, emotional violence. And as an African, you know, our people were forced to be Americans. Our people were forced onto this land after the 13th and 14th Amendment, we're given no say on whether we want to be um, American. Um, Jihan hinted at this boarding school practice and the illegality of having traditional uh, beliefs, forced to be Christians. Um, many countries all around the world are forced to have certain economic uh, projects of modernity, forced via austerity, forced via um, financial institutions. And so part of this, this art project that I'm working on that I'm just beginning is about Detroit's communication to the world. And part of it is healing from violence. Part of it is um, healing from the things that we were forced to do, forced to go to school or your kids will be taken away from you. I've been working with people, including white people. I think part of what's going on is this pandemic is showing people that this Western society shit is not working. And all sorts of people, a variety of nationalities are looking harder and looking more seriously than they ever have before. And so I think that part of our story as Africans who were colonized and forced into this project for a few hundred years now is to kind of help lead the way of this unlearning of this loosening of our limbs of this even saying no you know what i'm saying like say fuck this no you know what i'm saying like helping people find their voice you know when you you're scared i i don't know if i can do it will i live will i die if i if i don't go to school maybe i'll starve if i say no they'll kill me i don't know oh i'm scared <laughs> you know we have generations of fear and so we want to help the world get past that fear, help the world to say, yes, we can put that shit down. This shit ain't working. Put it down, baby. Put it down. Put it down. Put it down, baby. This shit ain't working. Thanks a lot, Olavi. Um, we have a new question, so let me share it with you. The question is, I understand that we're going through an existential threat, and I can see many examples of transformation, even major transformations. With capitalism, power structures, and the structural violence we've experienced over the past centuries are still there. So how can communities experience metamorphosis at the local, national, or international levels if these structures are still in place? Yes, so um, conceptually, to, to, to start with, um, metamorphosis is... is uh, trying to capture or to, or to, or to or, or first of all, maybe it's um, it's a, a concept developed also by uh, Ulrich Beck, 
in relation to a diagnosis that um, modernity or the, the modern social order has a side effects, destructive side effects, like a ecological side effects, which are increasingly becoming main effects um, and side or main effects of modernity that are self-destructive of the foundations of the modern order. Um, so to give a concrete example, um, that environmental policies, uh, or, 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 which are part of, of the way modernity reacts or tries to cope with its ecological side effects, uh, get increasingly dysfunctional and, and fail to, to address uh, the, the problems. And um, if we think of, uh, of the way science or the role of, of, of science, for instance, uh, in relation to, to the way society um, or looks at and reacts to, to climate change, for instance, or other large scale social ecological disruptions, um, that basically, yeah, that, that, that modern society kind of gets exhausted in its own contradiction or dysfunctionalities because it, it, it fails to, to control or to master uh, its destructive side effects. Um, and then metamorph and, and then you have also discourse about collapse, collapsology. Um, so, so the end of the world, the end of the modern world, and metamorphosis is basically trying to add something to say it's not only it's just a collapse of one world of maybe the modern world, modern worldviews, modern institutions, modern practices, which kind of get uh, destabilized or unsettled uh, by these uh, side effects. And metamorphosis is an invitation also to look at the emergence of something new in this context. So basically, it's, it's a meta, it's a metaphor, but it's the idea that within a context of a system that uh, gets dysfunctional out of its own contradictions, maybe in this context, something something else, something new arises or emerges. And metamorphosis is trying to, to capture or to grasp this. Um, so it's maybe more radical or more fundamental than just transformation, uh, if you think of, of the, um, yeah, the reports of IPCC or IPBES, etc. All the talk about trans transformation towards sustainable development which very much remains within the, the idea that um, yeah, problem solving, control, pathways. So you have a chapter on pathways to transformation towards sustainability, step one, step two, step three, step four, which, which is very much, yeah, which remains within the, the framework of modernity and planning and anticipating. And so metamorphosis is more, it's, yeah, also maybe trying to, to let it go and to to try to to embrace other ways of thinking, other approaches, other ways of uh, yeah of coping with uh, these ecological challenges, and then of course as a, as a sociologist, so the point is, am I in a position of distance observer, just trying to 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 look at it empirically and trying to to theorize also uh, or to grasp conceptually what 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 might be uh, happening. Um, but it's also about uh, yeah ch change happening and also like discourses and ideas and so becoming involved maybe in, to some extent in metamorphosis. What's interesting and what I was somehow expecting is that the questions we are prepared are not going to be very relevant as far as we go into the discussion. So I'm trying to reformulate the questions that we have a bit for the, the second question. Uh, based on all you've shared and how maybe the very distinction between transformation and metamorphosis is in itself a product of the modern mind frame. And so in a way, it's not really relevant to look at it this way because we're just replicating uh, all ways of seeing the world that may be in contradiction in itself with the metamorphosis that could be happening. So what would be interesting for us or what we, were, we would like to ask from you is that whether you position yourself in this understanding of metamorphosis or transformation, how do you try and contribute to this movement? I mean, do you try to contribute to some movement through your work as activist, post activist or artist? Do you have a vision in mind of where you would like um, the world to go to? Or are you somehow, you know, letting the process unfold, adapting to it? Is it more about navigating the process? Is it more about seeing some situations you want to stop or having a clear vision of where you want to go, or maybe something totally different. So I'm interested to see how you position yourself, your work, and your possible visions. Uh, I've been thinking about this idea of uh, tragic tree and escaping the tragic tree, or tragic trees beyond, but the tragic trees which are 
are outlined in our sustainability conversations, where do they ultimately lead and what do they really challenge? In a sense, they're part of the same structures and they are repeating the same kind of uh, technological um, capitalist solutions. And the problem itself is uh, sort of replicated in the solutions. So if you have large ideas of geoengineering or river linking or you know, putting people on Mars uh, as a solution to sustainability as the planet getting destroyed. And I think we are creating, replicating the same problems which led to the Anthropocene in the first place, which is, the, you know, about about the deep uh, inequities and the, and the power imbalances and, and the, the separation of nature from, from human society, which led to the problem in the first place. We're not dealing with them. We're just trying to escape them and find other ways and the ways we're finding are not going to be equitable either. So we're not increasing Earth democracy. We are we are just following the same path. And um, so I was again I referred to my work with the Fisher people, Fisher folk, and a question came to me uh, while I was working with them. And I think my co-panelists Obalabi and Jihan would understand this very well. I think they are people who are embedded in their communities. I'm an observer to a community. Uh, is that when I was talking about, we were, we were talking for years about the sea, and the question kept coming to me, is the sea I see, is the sea they see? Are we talking of the same thing? Because the sea is not just a biological entity, it's also a cultural uh, perspective, in a sense. It is, we, we treat like, like people like Jihan talked about, what is this land? You cannot have uh, a community without land. Indigenity is with land. And how you relate to the land is so critical. So what is the sea for, for a traditional fisherman? And uh, I, 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 I thought I, we were not talking about the same thing. For me, as an urban person going to the sea, it was something aesthetic. It was something to be, uh, to be, um, you know, to be thought about in, in scientific ways. But it was not an inhabited space. It was not an extension of my, my everything, in a sense. And to dig into this deeper, I uh, tried to look at very early, uh, you know, almost uh, 2000 year old text uh, from in their language, the Tamil language. And there's a whole body of poetry called Sangam poetry. And what Sangam poetry deals with uh, in uh, as early as uh, 400 uh, BC, uh, it's in that period. And some, the, there are some parts of it remaining which they found in papyrus in, in the late 19th century. And so uh, it really describes as one part of the po poetry set, it describes the relationship with, with the surroundings, with ecology. And these are basically love poetry, but it, it is describing its relationship to the planet in which the love takes place. And it's a sort of, we can talk about it for a long time, but just to kind of keep it short, that uh, it's the relationship to 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 uh, to ecology or to the na to nature around is not a, a relationship of any functionality. It is a backdrop in which human life exists. It is not something which is evoked as either metaphorically human or for the purpose of human or as part of a human vision. It is just a descriptive, separate world in which there's interaction and entanglement and which love, love takes place. And they're described five landscapes in that. Now this complex entanglement and this kind of respectful relationship, which we call with something called nature, uh, this is, I think, an ontological question. It is not just a question of how we, what is how we know something. Through what self do we know something? Like Jihan just talked about the table, that this is not a table, this is the place where I do something on this different relationship to, to everything, it's very hard to translate into, uh, into just as a translation. It's a different being. It's a different way of being. It's a different way of inhabiting. How do we then understand this from our current ways of knowing? If, how, do we, how do we converse with this when we encounter, encounter these words? And we don't have the language to encounter this. We don't have the ability, we have lost the ability to encounter and to understand it on its own terms, because it's going to shift us so fundamentally into a different sense of ourselves, into a different relationship to, uh, of, of humility, of respect, of coexistence, 
which are just words right now in, in terms of, in UN terms or in language terms, that I feel at a loss of how to proceed with that conversation. And I think uh, that this is a very critical part of what we need to do. Because if you want to break the trajectory, what is the trajectory? We have to, it's not just a trajectory outside of us, it's a trajectory within us, which modernity has brought in this idea of alienation. You know, liberty and equality, fine, but also the alienation it leads to, individual alienations. From How do we go back from that uh, alienation into cooperation, into, into coexistence, uh, into an unalienated being? You know, something which nature becomes not expressed, but as a, a larger landscape of how we look at things. So I think a uh, lot of my current concerns and uh, my, uh, is of course, you know, there are, you examine the things in this political context and it's uh, in what's happening, but how do you escape that? And I find it very hard escape, except to dig into resources which are increasingly being lost in the world because we don't know how to deal with them. We don't know how to converse with them. And I think this is a kind of challenge. And this is, a, to me, a metamorphosis uh, from, from this current moment into something else. It's an ontological shift. And I think my co-panelists will be able to elaborate that if they want to uh, uh, much more because they, inhab they inhabit it. They inhabit it. I observe it. Yeah, thanks a lot for those observations that feel deeply felt to me. So I don't know if they're just observations. <laughs> I can relate to the feelings that they convey uh, in a much more, like beyond the words, I would say. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to let either Owelabi or Jihan come next, whoever wants to go next. I can add some thoughts. I agree with a lot of what Ravi said, and I really liked what you said about you know, am I seeing the same sea as they see? You know, <laughs> like that, I think that's so true. I think, I mean, I think we are in a metamorphosis. And I think like, when I think of metamorphosis, I think of right butterflies, right? Or like their unique evolution in their life. And what makes it um, special is like, they break down, they change into something completely new. And their pupa, like they break down into goo, right? <laughs> and then that turns into a completely new creature. Like, and so in that way, I do think we are going through a metamorphosis. And it's funny because um, part of the reason why I, want, I said yes to doing this panel even was because that was the way it was presented. And 2020 for me, like a year, I, it was a year that I meditated a lot on the concept of metamorphosis because <clears throat> there was a moth infestation in my house. You know, <laughs> like just randomly, like I couldn't figure out how to get rid of these moths. Like I kept seeing golden moths everywhere. And I mean, I took it as a sign that I need to think about that. <laughs> think about the moth, think about what it represents, think about its life and to try to identify for myself what stage, at least I was thinking, what stage am I at, you know, <laughs> in my transfer? Am I at a place where I'm like the caterpillar and I'm just eating everything and trying to like build up my strength and get my resources together? Am I in the cocoon changing? You know, am I about to get out of it and release myself? So like, I was really challenged to think about that, you know? <laughs> and um, so I think it is happening. You know, at first, I mean, I, I really took it as it's happening within me. I would say like, just in terms of, um, I'm still like an organizer and an activist, but I refuse to ever work the way that I used to again. You know what I mean, like, I'm not going to spend like 80 hours doing this stuff and like live under stress and like, all, because that's not good for any human and that's not a good way to model. And we're not going to create, you know, what we're talking about by existing in the things that we're trying to stop. You know what I mean? So I think that's where we are. But I agree with Ravi that it's like, it means something different for each of us. What Navajo people <laughs> need to do or should experiment with or direct questions that we need to ask ourselves and discuss amongst ourselves are not going to be the same, you know, as another group of indigenous people, let alone black people in America, let alone white people in America, let alone other people of color in America. You know, we, the thing that we have, and I would say like, um, oh, what was the other part I was going to say? Um, 
yeah, it's our relationship to this system and society that needs to change in different communities have different relationships to that system. So there's an assumption by those people who benefit you know, from this way of life and that, oh, this is just the natural way it is, you know, but there have been ever since the society has um, started to, well, ever since really, I think colonialism, I think before, I think patriarchy is the root of all of this, honestly, but certainly ever since colonialism, you know, patriarchy taking over Europe, but as that was all exported, you know, here to the United States, there have always been people who doesn't, who do not accept this modern world, who think it's wrong and who has fought against it. And that's, you know, my people from both sides of my lineage, you know what I'm saying? And me, you know, I organize against this stuff. So it's, that's not new. Do you know what I'm saying? saying and it's like it's almost kind of like that's a privilege to say like oh things are new now things are changing and the environment is forcing us to change that is true but it's also people you know who have been forcing and creating this change as well and I I kind of look to those same people to help us to organize um, and be intentional about what we do and how we get out of it based on who we work with and who our communities are overall um I think we all need to do a much better, all humans need to do a much better job of incorporating our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual capabilities into everything we do, right? Because our society has separated all that from <laughs> like, uh, oh, emotions is bad. Spirituality, oh, that's just like woo woo, or it's like, you know, stuff that doesn't belong in science, you know, <laughs> doesn't belong in like debates and government, but it does, you know? So those are the questions then. And I would like challenge every individual to like ask themselves that question. Like number one question, how do you connect with what's greater than you? And how do you bring that into what we're doing and these questions that we're asking and the work that you're doing now? How do you get that advice from your ancestors? <laughs> of how you're supposed to move forward. You know what I mean? Like everybody can do it. All humans have that capability. It's just been untaught to varying degrees amongst us, but that's, I think, the direction we should all be moving towards. Thanks a lot, Jehan. Oh, well, Abby, do you want to add something to that question? Yeah, yeah, I love this build um, about the different perspectives. Um, I love this build about how, where we're enmeshed gives us different perspectives. And so we have different questions to ask. Um, when I was brought into organizing in Detroit, you know what I'm saying? The phrase was, it's all about relationships. You know what I'm saying? So um, I want to start this response first by giving a shout out to Jihan, a public shout out. Um, I think I told you this story. She gave a speech in California on environmental justice and just transition that changed my life. Um, I don't remember if it was five years ago, six years ago, something like that. At the time, I was firmly within an environmental justice perspective that was still rooted in the um, assimilationist, modernist perspective. And she gave a perspective on culture and how environmental justice was not just about money, was not just about jobs, was not even just about pollution, you know. And I realized I've never heard a quote unquote African American uh, talk like that. You know what I'm saying? And so it brought me in this thing of, it brought me to ask questions that I only I could ask as an African. You know what I'm saying? It brought me on a journey of what my work is in this world, you know, as a deeper Af Detroit African. And so I want to um, begin this second question by just saying, Buju, which is a, um, a Nishinaabe. Uh, greeting the Anishinaabe people of the three fires throughout the whole Great Lakes region, all up into what is called Canada. They're leading a lot of the fight against the Canadian imperial system, the uh, Badawatami, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, uh, three people coming together to form a, a one people. You know what I'm saying? Those who are on Zooms with me a lot, they know sometimes I don't look at the... Uh, thing, camera. Sometimes I look up right here and that's because my vision is pointing out to this window. And there are these two trees, you know what I'm saying, out this window, yo. And these are some fucking Anishinaabe trees and they, they wanted 
me to mince them in this joint. You know what I'm saying? They, I was laughing. They've been just sending me like vibe, you know what I'm saying? Like throughout this whole thing. And they really wanted to be present in this um, question. And so part of this question of how do I contribute to this metamorphosis, um, it brought me to um, some, something that we do at these events. And this is the tradition of land acknowledgement which is becoming more and more popular in the United States, beginning various sessions with a land acknowledgement of Waiwad Yatanong, uh, which means just about where the water curves around the land in the Nishinaabe Mowin, um, which has always been a meeting location for indigenous people. And this is the place that is now known as Detroit. Um, but I also have just started citing the work of the Waiwad Yatanong Arts Council to facilitate the coll coll collective liberation of all, though advocating for the repatriation of all indigenous land and life. And their work right now, it starts by centering a, around the colonial institution called the museum. And their vision is to implement land acknowledgements that move beyond symbolic gestures and include short-term and long-term plans for the redistribution of institutions, power, privileges, resources, land, and also stolen artifacts, you know what I'm saying, from those people. And one of my intentional practices has been intentionally cultivating exchanges between Africans and indigenous people, especially the Anishinaabe of the Great Lakes area, to talk about our struggles for sovereignty, our struggles with assimilation, and hip hop, plant medicines, and reclaiming history together have been key languages of this exchange. It's very relevant that an African cultural organizer is talking to a group hosted by Europeans about reparations as a part of metamorphosis. I'm thinking of the work of Walter Rodney, who documents how the whole thing that's called modernization was created from the exploitation and conquering of peoples, especially um, the continent of the Americas, Africa, Asia, the world, you know how that goes. Um, and Jihan talked about that when she talked about the battery, you know what I'm saying? Like being a battery, but not having the electricity yourself. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Dorothea Thomas of Modern Soulful Living sends this morning message today. She says, a new generation is rising up like the sun. The world as we know it has already ended. The purging for the new world has begun. A cleaning process that will come in many waves. Expiration dates and timelines are speeding up. A redistribution of resources on a spiritual level. This is just the beginning. Take this time to heal what's been hidden, build spiritual partnerships with like minds and keep your heart focused on the creative force. Don't dim your light because others are intimidated by your shine. And then lastly, um, if I have time to make one more sentence or two. Um, this conversation reminds me, um, Samir Amin, I believe is his name. I read a book by Samir Amin a few years ago, and I wrote a little uh, review of this book. And this book is called Eurocentrism. And it really helped shift me on a whole new thing. And I think this is what the three of us are actually saying in a way to this European audience. And in this book, Eurocentrism, Samir Amin, he studied world history, he studied economy, and he said that there's a lie which told people that Europe was always dominating the whole world. Like the story is that you had the Greeks and the Romans and they kicked everybody's ass and then now Europeans kick everybody's ass and Europe has always just kicked everybody's ass. But the Europe of 1492 was just a two-bit player. You know what I'm saying? Like in 1491, Europe wasn't that tough. You know what I'm saying? Europe was just a, the Middle East had it going on. Africa had it going on. Europe would go to Africa and just be like, wow, what, what, I, ugh. you know, there are people in our community that talk about, you know, we helped bring the Europeans out of the caves and taught them how to wash. You know what I'm saying? And I, I say this to say that Europe came out of the margins to become important. So when you're looking for metamorphosis and you're looking at what currently is the dominant thing, you're not looking in the right place, baby. Because this world is moving in different ways. You see what I'm saying? So even in a historical perspective, you know what I'm saying? It's cool. Whatever y'all do, the European thing is cool. And I wish you the best, baby. 
you know what I'm saying? But I'm an African baby and I got to do the African thing, you know? And so if you have the humility, do you want to stay on top? You know, are you going to get mad and send nuclear missiles if these brown people start doing something that you think is better than you? Are you going to get jealous? Are you going, God damn it, Biden, send some missiles over there and get them. You know what I'm saying? Like, so if that's the question for the Europeans, if things shift, when you say metamorphosis, are you assuming like the movie, The Jetsons, that you're going to be in the spaceship, riding the iPad, doo, 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 doo. you know what I'm saying? And somebody else is going to be on the bottom digging in the dirt. Oh, I hope I got to mine these crystals for the solar panels oh, so they can have a lifestyle. Oh. You know, is that the picture of this metamorphosis that you have in your hand? And so is what's going to be your feeling if it's a different colored person, if it's a different country, if it's a different language, you know, how are you going to feel? And that's part of the metamorphosis, you know, that the European descendant people have to look at, because I think in their imagination, they still think and they rule in the world. Sometimes you kind of get that vibe when you talk to even the metamorphosis, even the European spiritual people, <laughs> you know, they, they, they still want to metamorphosize and rule the world. So that's uh, the last question that I asked to the group. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I think that's some of the fascinating part of the metamorphosis that we don't know where it's heading. And I guess that's why it's also very scary for many people is that once it starts, you don't know what the end result is. And it, it implies a certain loss of control or a certain yeah, loss of trajectory, um, which, is, which makes it all the more interesting and, uh, and open. I'm very curious if there are some questions or some feedback from the audience uh, on those different ideas. Patriarchy has rampaged the planet in every way. And I believe we are now trying to return to the ancient ways of being, to the feminine side. We need to embrace a more collective mindset of femininity, being together and coming together. Going back to the butterfly analogy, we would currently be in the pupa stage and I'm looking forward to the butterfly stage. That being said, I'm sure the caterpillar didn't have much fun when transforming into a butterfly. I'll use the opportunity just to, to share one thought I had while listening um, to, the, to the conversation, um, which is about like this metaphor of metamorphosis um, coming from biology. I thought that uh, the caterpillar moving to a butterfly is also like a, a genetically uh, programmed process. Uh, whereas when we use uh, metamorphosis uh, to talk to what we have been talking about uh, tonight, um, it's like about uh, social metamorphosis, also individual metamorphosis. I mean, I mean it, it seems obvious that it's also like changes um, uh, rising or, or emerging within uh, individuals and not, not, not just about in social systems, um, then it's, it, it might be a different process because it's much more open and unprogrammed, it's much more contingent. So, so there was the idea that metamorphosis happens on us or it happens, it's, it's not controlled, it's not, uh, it's a, the end effect might not be as beautiful and harmonious as a butterfly and no one knows what kind of reality one might uh, arrive in after leaving modernity behind and, and letting other things emerge. Um, it's also a little speculative because we're, we're, we, we seem not to be there yet, but there is uh, a deep change going on. Um, and any, uh, yeah, and, and just I, I thought if, if it's, yeah, it's, it's contingent, but so, so we, we, can, we can participate in shaping this. And then I was just um, struck by, by one, I don't know, the tension or something, which is that there's a lot of, I mean, we, on the one hand, we, we, we heard about um, entanglement of uh, overcoming differences, overcoming separation, uh, silos, etc. On the other hand, there's a lot of uh, like identities uh, uh, of uh, uh, the male on the one side, the female on the other side, the Europeans on the one side, so, uh, the indigenous, uh, the Africans, etc. So, so it, it just raised, yeah, I don't know, questions uh, within you know, how to deal with the, the two aspects, not to say that, not, not to negate differences uh, or not to to, to, um, to homogenize something and, and overlooking, uh, yeah, embedded realities, experiences, worlds and differences on the one hand, and on the other hand, 
this yeah metamorphosis seems also to be like something planetary that it concerns us all uh, in different ways um, so we are all in an, in it together somehow so this is what just just a reaction uh, yeah thanks damien um we have another question that is this lecture series seems to suggest that metamorphosis arises out of dysfunctionalities but the poor and the marginalized have been living in dysfunctionalities for centuries, yet we have not seen metamorphosis. Why would we consider that metamorphosis will occur as an escape from dysfunctionality now? Yeah, I, um, I, um, let me think how to say this, let me think how to say this, let me think how to say this. Uh, I mean, actually, I need a second to collect my thoughts. Dysfunctionality, I, I, I say dysfunctionality is not just with the poor. Dysfunctionality, what I would say, which comes to the patriarchy and the uh, matriarchy and the what time it is today, I don't know about where you are, but actually I have a friend that's in India and he describes a lot of uh, violence. and One, to say violence is a dysfunctionality. How about that? How about say if you are violent and you're violent upon other people, that's a dysfunctionality. You know what I'm saying? You can go to Socrates and the question of would you rather be the one killed or the be the one getting killed, which one is more dysfunctional, you know, to take it back to the philosophy and the Socrates. Um, but I would just say in a sentence, and then I'll collect, see if there's any more thoughts. This coronavirus is showing the dysfunctionality that most of our people, whether you call it, I don't, I don't even know how to define this, our people, most people in the world, most people is not controlling this system that is dysfunctional and that is allowing people to get sick and die. And I think many people have a sense that if we communicated more, if we shared more, if we were together more, even if this virus still existed, so many people don't have to die. And so the dysfunctionality is not merely those on the bottom. And I think many people are seeing the dysfunctionality is also in this system. And as an African, you know what I'm saying, whose father uh, had to pick cotton as a child, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we, we, we don't even need to go into all the historical violence, but I just wanna say that, you know, violence is dysfunction. And to be a violent person in a violent society is a dysfunction, although it's usually applauded at being the champion and being the greatest. Yeah, so thank you for the for bringing this perspective on, on violence and dysfunctionality. Um, and just maybe in one sentence also, uh, allowing myself to, to react on the, on the question, maybe it's, it's the idea that um, yeah, that, that, that modernity has thrived over the past 200, 250 years, and especially uh, over the course of the 20th century. Um, and that there have been a lot of dysfunctionalities, but rather at the periphery, and that uh, the center maybe has uh, been for a long time convinced about, um, yeah, the idea of progress, the idea of, uh, of linear progress, and, um, and the fact that this yeah, that, that, that modernity and development, which is like about modernization in the, in like uh, in the global south, etc., is for the betterment and improvement, and it can work and, and uh, indefinite economic growth and control, yeah, controls through technological improvement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that with climate change, to, to to take just one phenomenon, this gets questioned very fundamentally, uh, also within the core of this order. So of, you, you also have like a, a eco-modernist approaches to uh, to climate change, for instance, uh, thinking with, or, yeah, uh, thinking that with more modernity, with more modernization, with more of the same system, we can solve, address, or overcome these ecological or social ecological uh, challenges or side effects. But uh, I think that metamorphosis is, is the idea that there, there's something else and that, uh, yeah, there's something else which is beyond this uh, hypermodernist response uh, to the situation we are we are in. Uh, this would be just one uh, one addition to to that. But uh, I suggest that we now move to the third and, and uh, 
And last point we, we, we would like to, to discuss and exchange about with you, which is uh, about the, the role of art, um, the role of art in relationship with, uh, um, with other fields uh, of practice, such as uh, the social and political dimension of, of your activities uh, and, and forms of engagement. Um, yeah, how, how do you experience the relationships or the roles of so the roles, the potential, the relationship also of, of art with, uh, with other, with the political and the social uh, in, in your practice and uh, in, in being involved maybe, maybe in processes of change or even of metamorphosis? Uh, um, how does it, how do you see the interplays between art, science, politics and uh, spirituality as well? Um, this is a third question, so I suggest that maybe uh, this time Jihan starts, uh, so that everyone will have started uh, uh, within one of the blocks. Cool. I'll try not to take all the time, guys. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm asking myself that question right now, honestly. Um, uh, I, you know, as you read in my bio early, like, although I've always had a long interest in art and painting, I never really did it because I was too busy, like I thought, fulfilling my responsibilities to my people, to my homeland, to my family, you know what I mean? I'm mean, kind of negating a lot of parts in myself. So I think um, there's a lesson in there, you know, for all of us to, to bring it back again to like every old philosopher to like know thyself, you know what I mean? Like, what are you good at? What is your purpose in life? You know? And what do you want to do, do you know and like and to honor yourself too so like i always I've, I've always felt that my purpose in life is to protect mother earth speak on her behalf and speak on behalf of the waters but i used to do that by writing foundation proposals and like managing staff meetings you know what i'm saying like that <laughs> that's part of it but that's not necessarily necessarily all of it so i had to find kind of other ways to do it um i think um I like what you said earlier about art not being used as an illustration, but as like to try and kind of like evoke a feeling or an experience or an understanding among people. And I think that's that that's what I think art can do to me. I'm still trying to think about it and experiment and like come come up with concrete projects. But um, I think it's all about being more creative and using our creativity, which again goes along with that principle of the feminine energy, which is the power of creation, you know, <laughs> to be brought back into our work, you know, and I think um, we're just going to be so much more effective when we can um, address and reach places that are beyond people's mind. <laughs> when you can reach their heart, when you can reach their spirit, you know, that's like, I think when real community building and understanding and change can begin. Um, for me, I'm really interested, like, again, knowing myself and who I am, like, I'm really interested in figuring out ways between Indigenous people and Black people, because that's who I am, you know what I mean? And I'm kind of like a, a relationship embodied, right? And so I take that also as, like, a responsibility that I am in this in-between zone, so I have a res not only a responsibility, but, like, an opportunity to bring these two types of people together, you know what I mean? I think Native people and Black people need to get together, together and create music. So I'm, I'm sure like, oh, well, I'll be like, you're on that tip too. But I feel like music between different groups will help us to understand each other and get to know each other better than looking at a PowerPoint and talking about, you know, what's going on at the International Framework Climate Convention on Climate Change. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we need to do that, but that's not really connecting people and just having us all look in the same direction. You know what I'm saying? So that's not building the relationship, that's building the definition and that's building the hierarchy. Um, so I think that's what art and creativity can help to do. Uh, I'm excited about it. And then I just wanted to show this painting that I'm working on. <clears throat> that's just the underpainting, but I thought it so fit in with the topic because I'm trying to paint like the tree of life with a branch that's burning away. And I, in my mind, that's our world. The, the values that we've been living in now, they're burning away because they don't actually support the tree of life. <laughs> like they're an experiment they happened, um, but now, you know, they're, I believe also that world is over and we're just beginning to like, not everybody, you know, most people now are just beginning to feel um, the impacts of that. And it's not, it's not like a beautiful butterfly, it's emerging, it's kind of scary. 
but that's part of it and we don't have to be afraid of it. I think we also need to kind of unlearn what we've been taught about the end of the world. You know, like there's a giant meteor and it's going to crash and everyone's going to die or, you know, there's a zombie apocalypse and people are going to start eating each other. Like that's not true. That just has been told us so that we'll be afraid of the world changing, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I don't think it is going to be that way. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> As a practitioner, um, for me, art is a, has, um, it's it's a it's a placeholder for complexity. It's a language, uh, which is uh, an affective language, where uh, uh, you don't have to reproduce the world, but you can actually help uh, uh, be part, create create a discursive element, be another pole of of create expand the the, 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 the discursive elements which are brought into the new discussions of something. So uh, art to me is a is is a is an independent language of of ordering complexity, and uh, I think that uh, uh, there is no way but to when we when we think of the questions uh, facing us today, the well, if you want to use the word existentialist questions facing us today, then we cannot but think of. Uh, an interdisciplinary or a trans or multi or you know maybe leading to a transdisciplinary approach because certainly we if if we had known what to do then we would have done it we don't know what to do we really need to create a new way of knowing something and i think we are at a stake that all the trajectories which are which we can we can think like we can we can extrapolate uh do not tell us that we, we know what to do. We are going down, going to walk off the cliff, so to say. And so you have to, we have to change the trajectory. That means we need a new language. So, uh, and the new language is of entanglement and complexity of a new viewpoint of a new inhabitation. And art is, I think, best placed because it is not locked into disciplinary, rigid, disciplinary rigidities. It's a very open language. And it is effective. It also uh, uh, is able to contain and uh, contain complexity and express it in a certain way, which uh, which is like the uh, uh, you know the uh, the uh, the the sort of the concentrate of that. You know what what really comes out, it, and it suggests new ways. So it's, it it opens locks up. It op opens up imaginary locks. To me, I, I believe really uh, deeply that art is probably the only way we can actually unlock anything right now. Uh, there is no other way. It is not. It is not something of the of 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 textual verbose imagination. When we are thinking of new ways of being, uh, how do we imagine that way of being? How do we think about? How do we experience that way of being? That affective language is very critical. So uh, I do believe that, um, and you know, the question is, what is art? You know, what is art is a big question. You know, it's not just a painting on the wall. Art is a way, a way of uh, of expression of uh, uh, of, um, of 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 an independent uh, way of new uh, suggestions, new futures, in a sense new imaginations and uh, artists we all we know have several times done things which have been portents of the future you know, before it happened in a sense so i'm a deep believer a really deep believer in uh, in the uh, in uh, thinking uh, through the artistic language i'm not saying that you have to be an art artist or not but thinking through that possibility of uh, open uh, creative thinking of open thinking about what those possibilities could be to think out of that structure we are locked in. Thank you. This is a, a beautiful topic to close upon. Um, personally, just as we push the language of transformation um, into metamorphosis, um, because of Ife Best, I've been pushing the language 
Oh, wait. First, I want to get a shout out to the sister from Ile Ife. Um, first, shout out. Uh, much respect. Um, much respect. Much gratitude. Very grateful um, for the words, for the energy from you bringing uh, your home into this space, which meant a lot to me. It was very significant. Um, um, second, um, in terms of language, uh, two words which were both mentioned or both hinted at uh, imagination and culture, um, especially as a, someone who does music, who does hip hop art, carries with it either uh, images of commodification. You know what I'm saying? Like hip hop has been gone through a, a huge commodification journey. Um, and uh, or elitism, like art is this elite thing that, you know, you got to go to a museum, you got to go to a thing. And we mentioned reparations and taking back from the museum. A lot of these things that people consider art, you know, these were meant to be used in culture. These were meant to be shared, but just people made them with such beauty. And then people looked at them and took them and took them from their homes and put them in museums, you know what I'm saying? because they weren't mass produced. They were made with beauty. And so culture is this thing that we're going to use. Culture is this thing that's a part of our everyday life. And maybe we can push the word art and change it. You know what I'm saying? But um, a lot of times, as Laura Lane mentioned at the beginning, when people hear the word art, their brain thinks that it, this is not this is not the important thing. This is just some shit that I do to relax. And even though relaxing is very important. And that's, as Jihan mentioned, these are the same people that don't value relaxing oftentimes too. Um, and so I'm working on this project, which is very much in line with uh, what Jihan hinted at. And it, right now it's called Right Relationship Aesthetic. It's going to be a two, three, it's going to start off as a three-year project. And maybe you can bring me back and maybe we can talk about it together again. Maybe we can connect about this project. But it has to do with Detroit as this deindustrialized city, which for many people, Detroit is a sign of economic failure. And Detroit conjures this image of scarcity, failure, poverty. Uh, what's the word that was mentioned? Dysfunction is another one. And so this art project is really showing these visions as people are afraid of cl climate collapse and, and people are afraid of economic collapse really want to show a vision, an artistic vision that shows, just like Jihan, you read my mind, we must be on a similar wavelength. Because the, the point of this project is to show a vision that, I don't want to say collapse can be fun because it's very, it's very crucial. And there's a lot of work that we have to do, but that work doesn't have to be memory. I mean, misery. That work doesn't have to be miser miserable. That work can be togetherness. That work can be and I think that that's where the, the feminine energy comes in. And I think it's only miserable if you got to fight against police and if you're going to like go to jail for like doing your ceremony and if you got to like sneak and be underground because the system is like trying to stop you and you fucking stressed out and shit. But if we can do this in the open air under the sun, you know, it doesn't have to be miserable. It could just be a change. It could just be a metamorphosis. Um, it can, you know, if we can grieve together, even death doesn't have to be as traumatic as it is. You know what I'm saying? And so I want to explore this through art. And I think Detroit has something to say. And I think everybody here on this panel has something to say. And I think that we're uh, part of creating a culture, a new culture, like Ravi said, that we've never seen before and that we've never experienced before. Thank you very much for listening. Let me be a part of it. So um, we'll, we'll end up so, this panel discussion and this, uh, this exchange uh, uh, now. So yeah, from, from my side, uh, from the side of the Forum Internationale Wissenschaft, this institute from the University of Bonn that has been organizing this uh, uh, lecture series. Thank you very, very, very much to the three of you uh, for, yeah, for having participated in, in this uh, closing session and this panel discussion. So, I've learned so much. Uh, my mind is like bubbling with uh, ideas and perspectives, and trying to make sense out of it. And then my heart is also like vibrating and trying to also. Uh, so yeah, it has been really inspiring uh, on many accounts. Um, 
And um, yeah, I would also like to to thank at this uh, or to take this opportunity to to thank uh, One Resilient Earth and Laureen and her team because they uh, have been partnering with us and working with us, collaborating with us uh, you know, for this joint uh, lecture series over the past few months. It has been a lot of work and uh, it has, has been a great collaboration. So thank you very much uh, for your input and. Uh, Thank you to all the um, team uh, of the FEV uh, who provided administrative and technical support, uh, especially uh, Mrs. Raja Bernard, uh, who really uh, yeah, was very present and, uh, and, and made things happen. Uh, so thank you very much uh, also to them. Um, thank you to uh, Christopher Symes from Tiny Wolf, who uh, helped us uh, produce uh, filmed lectures, so thanks to the, the technical assistance of, uh, of uh, Tiny Wolf. Um, I hope I don't forget anyone. Um, and Laureline, maybe do you, do you want to, to say something? Yeah, I will not take much more time because we're already over time, but I'm also very grateful for all of you who have come tonight and shared your experiences, your thoughts, your ideas, your feelings with us. I feel extremely, um, yeah, extremely privileged of being here tonight and being able to hear from you and that you accepted to, to come and share with us, uh, Europeans who are definitely in need of different perspectives and understanding and very much eager to, um, to really think through everything we hear and try and feel through it. Although we've not been brought up in a way that helps us do that but i think it's a very important part of the work we're doing today um so yeah lots of gratitude um for for this event tonight um and thanks for all will be to put us in contact with jihan who was able to participate um and yeah just to close it i i think i'm just gonna thank the university of bonn for taking the risk of of having this collaboration with us uh, because we brought in all those different perspectives, we brought in arts that were usually not in the lecture series, we brought in different ways of um, of talking about those scientific topics and uh, and of looking at them through different perspectives. So I'm I'm very happy that this could happen and materialize. And I look forward to continuing collaborating with all of you in different ways. Um, we we do lots of work on Run Resident Earth in this relationship between arts, science, uh, spirituality, ancient wisdom, and how how can we think about a different way of being in the world, working and living in the world. So be happy to continue on that with you and um, yeah, and interact with you in this way in the future. So thanks a lot.